Welcome to Genomics in Java, a place where we share science stories and conversations that we hope that you'll find as enjoyable as what's in your cup. My name is Jennifer Carden, and with us again today, we have Dr. Neil Lamb. And so, Neil, this morning, what's in your cup? Ah, so I actually don't have coffee in my cup. I am a tea drinker, so I have a great big uh, cup of English breakfast tea um, sweetened with honey and whole milk. Oh. How about you? You know, a lot of mornings I have tea, but this morning I have a Pike's Place uh, coffee with some sweet Italian cream. Just, just a nice, warm and cozy fall. That sounds nice. So as I think about all the diversity of the things that I find in my pantry, from coffee and types of tea, to going into the bathroom and looking through the medicine cabinet, we've been talking about all of the different things that, uh, stories we would find in the guidebook and things that we would find in the medicine cabinet. And so I want us to talk just a, a little bit more about a couple of those stories. So the first one is in the fall, there is something about a school in the fall and you walk in to a gym and it just has a particular scent. It's Eau du Gym. Especially it's, in a middle school. Oh, especially in a middle school. <laughs> there is the, that smell of, of body odor. And so what can research tell us about what, what causes body odor and why do we all wear deodorant anyways? Oh yeah, so, so, so this year's guidebook does include a number of biotech stories that relate to things you would find in your medicine cabinet, including um, an understanding about the pathways that lead to body odor. So, so there's a, a little bit of background. Um, sweat produced by your sweat glands has no aroma. It is, it, it is odorless. There are bacteria that live all over your skin and certain of those bacteria take in the molecules that are in that sweat, take in the chemicals in that sweat, and they break it down. They actually get nutrients from it. Sweat-eating bacteria. Sweat-eating bacteria. Everything has its own niche, but sweat-eating bacteria. And some of these sweat-eating bacteria, in fact, a small minority of these sweat-eating bacteria, in breaking down the sweat, they actually produce an odor molecule. So body odor comes from only a small percentage of a type of staphylococcus on your skin that have the ability to take sweat, take molecules in sweat and break it down. And one of the byproducts is this odorous molecule. So the specific pathway to get us to that odor molecule wasn't understood until a collaboration between a research lab and actually Unilever, a big, um, a big yeah, soap. Yeah, big soap company. Yes, yes. So they identified the specific type of Staphylococcus bacteria and the specific enzyme. And it's interesting because they were able to take the gene for that enzyme and put it in another bacteria that normally doesn't produce odor and that bacteria now produced odor. That, that frightens me. I think we wanna, you know, but, but anyway. Stinky bacteria. Stinky bacteria that aren't supposed to be stinky. But the concept is by understanding the specific chemical process that leads to body odor, you may be able to develop a more effective deodorant that only deals with blocking that one odor producing chemical process and doesn't throw off the balance of the bacteria that normally live on your body. I think we will all be looking forward to seeing that on our shelf sometime soon. <laughs> I think so too. Especially those who may have, have um, young children. So the next thing in our medicine cabinet that many of us see is a box of hair color. And while it's super trendy, um, 2020, I think some of the headlines say that gray hair is trending. And while some of that is trending, some of us uh, don't like for our gray hair to show. And so how, what is the science behind gray hair? So, you know, the old wives tale is that stress can turn your hair gray. Um, and the story that's in this guidebook actually says that there is some truth to that. Uh, that is not necessarily great news for those of us who might be experiencing high levels of stress right now. Well, anyone who is living through 2020 or it's anyone who is parenting a child. So 2020. Is probably dealing with higher levels of stress. Uh, what's interesting about this story, so this is work that was done in mice okay. and they found that when um, a specific part of the mouse's nervous system, the sympathetic nervous system, is what responds to stress. And it gives you the flight or fight response, that am I gonna flee or am I gonna stand my ground? And that, that set of neurons, the sympathetic nervous system neurons, release 
a chemical called norepinephrine. It's a neurotransmitter. Neuroepinephrine. Neuroepinephrine. Okay. In that flight or fight response. And that specific neurotransmitter, hang with me, we're gonna go down a couple of levels, but then we'll come back up. Okay. That specific neurotransmitter actually impacts the cells that give rise to melanocytes, which give pigment to your hair. So okay. there are a set of stem cells that continuously divide and reproduce and make more and more melanocytes throughout the life of the hair follicle to keep the hair colored. But this norepinephrine from the stress response actually causes these cells not to continue to divide and make more of themselves, but to all turn into melanocytes. And melanocytes are those pigments. Are those pigments. Okay. So they, they produce the pigments. They produce the pigments. Okay. So, so the stress response forces all the cells to now become what's called differentiated. They're at the end of the road. Okay. They have a short lifespan. They produce their pigment. And when they die, there were no stem cells left to make more melanocytes to produce more pigment. So the hair turns gray because it now lacks color. So again, this is in mice, but it suggests a clear pathway between stress, these stem cells, and the ability to continue producing pigment. So, we'll see. Stress management? Stress is, management is maybe good for your hair. Maybe good for your hair? That's right. That is, that is fascinating and definitely some uh, food for thought. <laughs> yes, maybe we should all be doing yoga and you know, re re reducing the stress and keeping the color in our hair. Like says, says the 50 year old who has a whole lot of silver at, at his temples and, and in his beard. So far I'm good, which must mean I've, I have learned stress management well. Teach me your ways. I am hoping to continue that. Speaking of continuing, uh, sometimes we look in our medicine cabinet and we might see for various different things, we might need pain relievers. And we know that there are um, many individuals, maybe some of you listening today, that may have to deal with chronic disease. And there might not be anything currently in your medicine cabinet um, to be able to help with that. Is there anything that genetics and biotech is doing uh, to be able to improve the quality of life for individuals that suffer with chronic diseases? There's a lot of genetic and genomic research going into understanding the underlying causes of chronic diseases, especially chronic pain. Um, this particular story in the guidebook is one of my favorites. It's about rheumatoid arthritis. And individuals who suffer from rheumatoid arthritis have periods of flare-up, so periods of increased pain, and then there are periods where it subsides, so it's an autoimmune disease. Um, this particular study looked at four individuals, which automatically means it's a small study, so we want to take it with a grain of salt, but it's a great place to start. Four individuals who weekly, for a period of one to four years, would do a blood prick all four individuals had rheumatoid arthritis and they kept a journal about their symptoms and they would do this blood prick and they would send the blood to the lab. So that means you've got over a four year window a set of details about here's what was in my blood and here's the way that I felt. And then the researchers took this incredible set of data and looked at when people had flare ups of their rheumatoid arthritis and they looked at their blood the week of the flare up and the two weeks before to see if there was anything different in the blood in advance of the flare-up that could be used to predict the flare-up. So it's a really cool story. Essentially what they're looking at is they're looking at tiny pieces of nucleic acid called RNA. And, and we won't dig deep into that, but, but they're looking for signals from cells that may be in the bloodstream and they're looking to see if there's a unique signal they can identify that correlates with an oncoming flare. What a fantastic tool for individuals to be able to have to know when a chronic flare-up is going to be coming so that they make sure that they have whatever they need or can head that off yeah. in advance. And, and, and what the scientists found is that they actually found a signature that corresponds to a specific type of inflammatory cell that they knew actually played a role in the flare-up and they found it in, they found its presence in the bloodstream a week or two before the flare-up. So as they further understand that biology, you could imagine a future test that is a finger prick and can tell you a flare-up is coming and then you and your doctor figure out how to treat it. I mean it is it's super early, it's an incredibly small number of people, but it shows the promise of this ability to really personalize 
what's happening, learning what's happening in your own body at this moment, and then make medical decisions based on that. It's exciting. This is incredible to think about the advances that are happening in science and to think about how science builds on itself. I love how you reference the fact that we had information, but we're learning even more that is going to have an impact down the road for human health. So thank you so much for sharing that insight My and pleasure. for sharing the, the most recent research that's happening that I know I will not look in my medicine cabinet the same way, and I'm sure the rest of you won't either. And so until next time, keep those conversations going and keep enjoying what's in your favorite cup.